Okay. Since coming to the introductory um, presentation on Tuesday night, I've been very aware of hearing evaluations yes. in myself and especially in other people. And so I started to wonder, you know, are all of those violent communications or would there be a way that some of those are, according to this model, nonviolent? I would say that any evaluation of others that implies wrongness is a tragic expression of an unmet need. Tragic in the sense for two reasons. First, it decreases the likelihood that we will get what we want. Even if we don't say it out loud, even if we think it, if we are even thinking that what somebody else does is wrong, it decreases the likelihood that we will get what we want. And second, it increases the likelihood of violence. So what could be more tragic than that, than expressing ourselves in a way that gets in the way of our getting what we want and increases violence? So anything that we want to say that implies wrongness on the part of the other person, I'm suggesting, is a tragic, suicidal expression of an unmet need. Say the need. Learn a need consciousness, which is what we're going to get to now, you see. That's how we evaluate in nonviolent communication. We evaluate from the heart. We make judgments, but we make need-serving judgments. We judge whether what people are doing is meeting needs or not. We don't moralistically judge the person for what they did. We judge whether it's serving life or not, because needs are our direct connection with life. They're the life that's going, needs are the life seeking expression within us. So we evaluate with reference to that. And that requires two kinds of literacy, feelings and needs. So let's be sure that we are all speaking the same language when I use the term feelings and needs. So under B, it says, imagine that you are talking directly to the person and express how you feel when the person acts in the way described above. And use this form. Again, we're talking to the other person, we're telling them now what they did, and we say, when you do this, I feel how. How do you feel when the person does what you wrote down under A? Write that down. When you do this, I feel angry. Okay. <laughs> Anger is a feeling created by unnatural thinking. We'll get to that next. <laughs> when, you're, when you're not ready to leave at the agreed time, I feel anxious and impatient. When you speak that loud, I feel intimidated. Oh! Intimidated is a diagnosis. Be careful of words that are more descriptions of other people, what you think they're doing to you, like intimidating you. So write down the following as not feeling words. Do not mistake these words as feelings. I feel misunderstood. I feel used. I feel manipulated. I feel judged. I feel criticized. I feel ignored. For example, aren't there times when you think somebody's ignoring you? Don't you feel relieved? <laughs> and at other times, don't you feel angry? You see, so words like that really say very little about what's alive in you. They say much more about how you are interpreting the other person's behavior. And above all, never mistake the word rejected as a feeling. I feel rejected. No, no. That's not a feeling. That's a suicidal interpretation. Okay, who's got the mic? There's the mic. Yeah. <clears throat> Hurt, disappointed, disheartened. Yep. Feel angry and betrayed. Angry, yes. Oh, for betrayed. Betrayed is one of those words like intimidated, ignored, misinterpreted, used, manipulated. It's more a diagnosis of the other person than a feeling. What about, what about contracted? Contracted? <laughs> if you mean tense and like that, uh, okay, if it's that. 
Um, when you call me up and speaking loudly, tell me you're going to cut off funding. I feel angry and scared. Mm -hmm. When you leave the dishes in the sink, I feel powerless over my environment and time, which feels frustrating and scary. When you start talking loudly in the middle of my sentence, I feel hurt because I think you are not listening to me. Yeah, the feeling is great, but you're going to lose it when you follow the word feel with the word because I think. Anytime you're thinking, your chance of getting what you need is greatly decreased. <laughs> Especially when you follow the word think with the word you. Then I think you not only won't get heard, I predict a defensive aggressive reaction. <laughs> So it's going to be hard for people to care about your feelings when you follow that with a diagnosis that implies wrongness. This is but really we'll get to that next, because we're going to see next that we, we, when after the feelings, there's two places we don't go, and one is up to our head. So we stay in the heart with feelings. We don't go up to the head. We stay in the heart and connect with needs. But we'll get to that, yeah. If we want to use nonviolent communication. We want to be sure that we do not use the feeling in a violent way because feelings can either connect us at the heart or they can contribute to more division and violence. So we certainly do not want to ever express our feelings in this way. I feel as I do because you. Okay? We never want to express our feelings this way. You make me feel. Now that will be a hard habit to get away from because in a jackal culture, feelings are very instrumental to using guilt as a way of manipulating people. See, the way to manipulate people is if you can convince them that they make you feel as you do, then they should feel guilty and change. You see. So it's another form of this violent game. So, for example, if you are a parent and you want to use feelings in a violent way rather than a connecting way, you would express it this way. It really hurts me when you don't clean up your room. Okay? Or, you make me angry when you say that. I was talking during the break about one of my happiest days as a parent was when my oldest son went to a jackal school for the first time. Uh, he had gone six years to a giraffe school that I had helped create. And, uh, but then he was, I wanted him to learn how to enjoy jackals as well. So, uh, and in giraffe schools, we also want to be aware that the children are not always going to be in this setting. So we want them to learn how to stay with their own values, regardless of which structure they're in, you see. So he comes back the first day from school, and he looked less than happy. And I said, uh, how was the new school, Rick? And he said, it's okay, Dad, but whew, boy, some of those teachers, Dad. I said, what happened? He said, Dad, I wasn't even in the front door, really. I was halfway through the front door, and some man teacher comes running over and says, My, my, look at the little girl. <laughs> Can you guess what the teacher was reacting to? Oh, yeah, my son's hair was down to his shoulders. See, in a jackal school, as we all know, authority knows what's right. See, there's a right way to wear your hair as a boy and a wrong way. A right way to do everything, and who knows? The teacher. And then what do you do if somebody doesn't do it? You use shame, guilt, and so forth. You use the word girl as though it's an insult. Welcome to jackal land. So I'm getting burned up, ready to go do a little bat therapy with the teacher. And, uh, <laughs> forgetting all about my uh, teachings. Uh, and I said to my son, how did you handle it? He said, I remember, Dad, that what you said, that when you're in that kind of environment, never give them the power to make you submit or rebel, you see. So one of the things we want to teach children very early, no matter what structure you're in, never lose track that you are free to choose what you do. 
Don't allow institutions to determine what you do. I said, hey man, that you remembered that, that's a big gift. I really love that you could remember that under those conditions. Then what did you do? I put on my giraffe ears, Dad, tried to hear what he was feeling and needing. I said, you remembered to do that? What did you hear? <coughs> Pretty obvious, Dad. Looked irritated, wanted me to cut my hair. Hey, wow, man, I'm really glad you could remember that. How did that leave you feeling? He said, Dad, I felt sad for the man. He was bald and seemed to have a problem about hair. 